and welcome to Start Right Here, a podcast where we discuss breaking in, standing out, and the path to success in the beauty industry. I'm your host, Corinne Corbett, and I hope the conversations I have with my guests inspire you to forge a path of your own. Let's get started. Social media is such an important part of every industry, particularly the beauty industry. And today's guest has an expertise in that. And she's going to tell us about her career path and what that skill set has allowed her to do in the beauty industry. Her name is Courtney Pope. Welcome, Courtney. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. I think it's really important, too, to have people at various stages of their career so that our listeners can hear how the job growth path may have changed over the years and what the current circumstances, how they impact careers. Can you give us your 30 second bio? Yes. So my name is Courtney Pope. I am a marketing consultant. My background is in social media and social media management, influencer marketing, content management, et cetera. I've had the pleasure of doing social and contributing to social for brands such as Eloquy, Kiehl's, and I'm currently with a beauty startup called Dark Beauty. Great. Looking forward to hearing more about all of those. Was the beauty industry a destination or a detour for you? The beauty industry for sure was a destination for myself. I grew up always loving fashion, but also equally loving beauty. I think I it just naturally comes to me and it came from the soul. My mother was and is still a Mary Kay consultant, so I got introduced to makeup very early on. My grandmother, sister owned a beauty salon, so I was literally in there every week, every two weeks, getting my hair done and spending time with my cousins and watching my aunt run her business. And then on the flip side, in regards to fashion, my grandmother, same grandmother, she was a seamstress. So I was used to being in her sewing room, watching her sketch outfits for clients, putting them together from start to finish. If I saw something in a magazine and I wanted it, but I wanted to kind of tweak it and make it funky and make it my own, she's like, we can do that. And that's how I really got bit by the beauty and fashion bug, like very early on in life, for sure. So essentially it's in your DNA. Oh, a thousand percent. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you go about getting your first job? So I actually got my first job because of social media. I was a college student. Obviously, social media was starting to really evolve. Then Instagram was starting to just take off. I feel like I'm aging myself, even though I am still young. But like essentially, like before Instagram really wasn't a thing. And then it slowly started to become a thing and brands were creating pages. And so that's how I actually discovered Eloquy was through social media. And I was like, wow, like I was really blown away by the clothes. I've been a plus girl all my life and have shopped at a run of the mill of all the places. And this was the one place for me that really stuck out that was affordable because they had great sales, but also very much so you could tell they were really into what was happening on the runway and translating that into plus fashion, which was for me as a young person was fantastic because I didn't want to look like a frump. So I started ordering clothes offline for them, really loved the quality. And I was like, so backing up when I was in college, I was a double major. So I doubled into journalism, mass communications and fashion merchandising and design. I discovered Eloquy, loved the clothes, loved the brand. I was like, I have to work here like post-grad, absolutely have to. And this was also coming on the heels of my internship where I interned at InStyle magazine. So I was definitely like in the fashion thing, like this is my jam, like have to do it by any means necessary. So I reached out about a potential internship and they had an internship available in the marketing department under social media, applied, blew it out the water. And actually I got the internship, but unfortunately just due to like logistics and to be honest, like the cost of living in New York versus what I was going to be paid in my hours, et cetera, like It just didn't make sense. So I had to respectfully decline. I knew for me, like, this is where I wanted to work post-grad. So I made it a choice to continue to stay in contact with them up until I graduated, essentially. So I was always like the woman on the social media team that I connected with. We kept in contact. Anytime I saw them doing something interesting or fun in the news, 
<clears throat> I would reach out and be like, oh my God, congratulations. Or anytime I was doing something of interest or had an update to my resume, sending that over to them and just keeping those lines of communication open. So you dropped so many lessons right there. I approached a company about an internship. You didn't look for an opening. You just approached them. No. And can I say with that too, that's always been like, there's always a method to the madness, right? So even before that and how I even nailed my internship with InStyle was that proactiveness. So me and uh, my best friend, she's literally still my best friend to this day. I had just come back from this summit. It was a career summit. Teen Vogue used to do, they don't do it anymore. I believe it's called Teen Vogue Fashion University. I applied got accepted. It was like a huge deal because it was literally like me and like one other girl who were going to be there essentially like representing our HBCU. And she was also in the fashion department with too. So it was like a really huge deal. Like I'm still to this day forever grateful to the like alumni association who like band together. They paid for my flight. They paid for my admission because it was expensive. Um, once I got accepted, then the actual admissions, I believe was like close to $400 or so. So they paid for my flight. They played for my admission ticket and everything like that. And then the girl who got accepted with me, she and I were actually cool because we were in the same department in fashion. And her aunt had a brownstone that she like would rent out and she let us stay in one of the rooms so we didn't have to worry about lodging. So I had just coming off the heels of that. And I was just so fired up because I used that experience as a networking opportunity. I was introducing myself to all the execs, introducing myself to any of the keynote speakers, collecting business cards, like the whole nine. And so when I came back, me and my good girlfriend, we decided like, we're not going to spend another summer working our retail jobs. We have these lofty goals for ourselves. We have to get our foot in the door somehow, some way. And so I knew at the time that we had decided Job postings had just started listing out the postings for spring internships. We went through all of those and collected all of the contact information from those listings for spring internships. We got our resumes together, went to the library, sat down, went through our list and just cold emailed all these people basically saying like, hey there, this is me. Like, here's what I do. Here's what my interests are attached to my resume. I saw your posting for spring internships and unfortunately due to class scheduling, I won't be available. However, I would love to hop on a phone call and possibly discuss an opportunity for your summer internship. <laughs> I'm going to say this and it's not necessarily for everybody, but this is how I got my foot in the door, just internships in general. I did tell a white lie <laughs> that ended up being extremely effective. I took it a step further and said, I'm actually going to be on the city in the city on these and these dates, and I aligned them with my spring break dates. Would love to know your availability for that week so we can connect for an interview. And that right there, I just started rolling, getting interview requests and everything like that. So then once the interview requests rolled in, I was like, okay, now I have to tell my mom what I've done so we can actually yeah. get these interviews. That was just how, I, <laughs> how I've always operated. It's just kind of like, Let's get the ball rolling. Let's jump ahead. I'm not saying to like lie. Like if you realistically know like your parents are not with it and you know, you don't have the means to actually like get there. Do not <laughs> lie. But my mom has always been extremely supportive and it's really a ride or die. And it's like, I know that at the end of the day, like there's a method to her madness and things always pan out and she always has a plan. So I'm a roll with it. And I've always been a high achiever. I'm not mad at it. I think people do that now when they're, I don't care what level a job they're looking for. They will always say, I will be in town on XYZ date as opposed to, I don't know when I'm coming to town. Or I can't. That's not going to get you an interview. What I think this is an example of, if you're interested in an industry and in a job is about the research, and then it is about like taking a chance. I have a, a mentee who got her job because she DM'd somebody. Listen, the world is like, is just always changing and like how you get your foot in the door is like constantly evolving. There are certain gatekeepers who will say like, oh, I hate it when people DM me, yada, yada, yada. It's so unprofessional. We need to take it back to the old school days. Like you need to know me, all of that. Fine. In those cases, you know, know your audience. There are others in the field who are very much interested and don't really care the means 
of how you reached out to them. I think it's all about the context and that you put thought into what you're actually saying and that you're not wasting that person's time. If you are very strategic about the way in which you reach out to them and the context in your messaging, I think anybody is open to at least taking a call, at least taking a virtual coffee with you or whatever, if, you know, if you're still in the pandemic right now and that kind of thing, you know, I just think it's all really just all about knowing your audience. Yeah. And I agree. So what was it like working at Eloquy when you did get the job? It was interesting because my journey with Eloquy was kind of like a bit of a loop, but everything I I knew I was doing was for the greater good. And it has been ever since because that's how I initially got my um, introduction into social media. So I graduated college. What school? North Carolina A&T State University. Oh, sorry. The illustrious (laughs) (laughs) North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Oh, let me stop. Okay. But I graduated A&T in 2016. And Up until that point, I had been continuing to build that relationship with my contact at Eloquy. We had a really great rapport. She was super like, just like nice and funny. And like, even if we weren't talking about Eloquy things, I didn't want it to be like a fake relationship of like, what can you give me type of thing? So we really did build that connection just off of like fashion and our love for social and all these other things. Her name is Alex. I am forever indebted to her because she literally gave me my start in social and taught me so, so much. And I like Still keep in contact with her to this day. Absolutely love her. Anyways, me and Alex kept in contact. And after I graduated, I updated my resume, let her know I had recently graduated and wanted to know if there were any openings in the New York office on their marketing team. She said, unfortunately, they didn't have any openings. But if I kept an open mind, they did have some opportunities in their um, other home office, which was in Columbus, Ohio. So she put me in contact with a woman named Mary and me and Mary connected. And at the time... Mary had just recently been brought on to Eloquy as their director of customer experience because prior to that, Eloquy Mm -hmm. had been outsourcing their customer experience team and their clothes were great, fashions were great, but the reviews that were tied to them that were negative all had to do with their customer experience. And for them, it's super important as a new brand, a new startup to really be in there, be highly engaged and build that rapport with your customer, especially as a startup, especially as a new brand. So I chatted with Mary. She talked to me about the opportunity. And then I came on board, moved, picked up my life, moved all the way to Columbus, Ohio. And I started working under Mary to assist with two other incredible women. And Mary, we sat down in a room and we just hunkered down and really built the customer experience of Eloquy from the ground up. So establishing tone establishing policies, establishing, you know, how do we speak to our customers on regular like channels, such as like emails and phone calls, as well as how does that then tie back to social media so that it's a seamless experience. We're in the age now where a lot of times social media has become customer experience. Clients and customers are more entail, like more inclined to reach out on social first when they have an issue with their order then calling the 800 number that's prominently placed on the website, it's on the receipt, all of that. They'll go to Twitter first, Instagram, whatever, and be like, hey, you know, so in a sense, they run hand in hand. So I did that for a bit, incredible time, because it really helped me and gave me the knowledge that I needed prior to coming to social to really understand who our customer was and how she interacts with us on social, how she likes to be spoken to, is she more conversational, is she more formal, like, that kind of thing really prepared me for everything else. So did that. And then shortly after Eloquy decided that they wanted to dip their toes in the water with brick and mortar. And so they opened a pop-up in DC. I have like eight plus years of retail experience. I had been a store manager before. I kind of had this innate ability with the customer and social media. I have a fashion background, so I know how to speak to the clothing. So I got promoted to project manager assisted in the opening of the pop-up location and then was acting as store manager during the pop-ups duration. From there, that's how I actually stepped into social. And that's how I got my foot in the door with social media. So Alex had come down to DC for the pop-up and was filming to get some social content. You know, she's like, I'm one person. I really would love to get more faces on our feed and involved in our social. Like, would you be open to hosting a Facebook Live for us 
And she just basically gave me the premise, which was just giving them like a sneak peek into the store, what we have available, what are some of my favorite styles, how I put them together, giving them like a tour of the store, et cetera. So I was like, oh my God, yeah, absolutely. Would love to, like, I'm totally down. (laughs) So we do that and it was a hit. Like, I can't remember. I think it was something crazy. Like we recorded the video. I think the entire store tour was like maybe 15 minutes long and at the end of it I think it got like 14,000 views or something crazy like that and it just kind of like became this thing of then like anytime Alex came down to DC she and I would get together sit down I would film content for them either for Instagram live or Facebook live and I was just any and everything that I wanted to do, any and everything that I wanted to talk about in regards to eloquently, in regards to fashion, they were totally open to it. And I loved it because it gave me the opportunity to answer style questions, talk to them about fit, talk to them about fabric and stretch and how they can increase the longevity of their closet. What are some great, you know, transition pieces as the seasons turn over and change, like all of the things. It was great. And it was like live and in action, like right then and there. So it was very like, had to be quick on your feet, a lot of it was just like off of the cuff, but it was just like a very natural rapport that I built with the audience and the effects reflected in sales. So it became this thing of like, anytime I spoke about something or anytime I was wearing something, that thing would either like jump as far as like being like snatched up on the site. And so that just kind of became like my thing. Essentially, you're the influencer inside the company. Yeah, basically. <laughs> in-house influencer for them yeah which totally made sense because they had such a growing demographic of african-american women in their customer base i'm not trying to like be like super influencer-esque i'm just being myself and this is what works for me i think the other piece of it too is like that really helped me was the knowledge that i had of fashion to be able to speak to fabrics cuts silhouettes like that whole thing from a very kind of like knowledgeable place. Not I'm like, not this is just a pinky nudie, you know, like <laughs> it's mauve. The, the color is mauve. We can say mauve. <laughs> you know? um, and that all helped me. So afterwards I moved back to Columbus for a brief while. And then I got the call saying like, Hey, there's a position that's opened up in our New York office on the marketing team with social. Would you be interested? Absolutely. <laughs> and I made the trek to New York. That's fantastic. You're at Eloquy. You're doing social. What skill did you learn there that you think set you up for success? The thing that set me up for success was being able to quickly like pivot and trusting like my gut. So like the thing that I'm most proud of at my time during Eloquy is the fact that like We did some really great content during my time there. And they were pretty much, because it was a startup, pretty much game for any and all ideas and willing to test and try like new things and new video styles and play with fonts and play with editing styles. And if there's a trend that's like we see happening on social that's starting to pick up momentum, like hopping on it and being able to pivot really quickly because there wasn't any like real red tape because they weren't like this huge corporation and just like figuring it out and constantly being able to be creative for me was something that I learned and learned very quickly that I loved and it it all helped me in the end game. Right. How'd you transition to beauty? Oh my gosh. So the thing is, is while all of this is going on, I'm loving the fashion thing. Beauty never like faded for me. Beauty never disappeared. I have always, always, always been the person who has loved fashion and beauty equally. And I'll never forget, it was actually during my time at InStyle, I took one of the beauty directors to coffee just to like talk and like get to know her. And she was asking me about my interests and I'm telling her everything that I love. And she was like, oh yeah. She's like, you know, but you know, eventually at some point you will have to choose, like you'll have to choose like either fashion or beauty type of thing. And I just remember like, "Mm, okay, lady, because I don't believe that. I absolutely don't believe that. Then they're just like, given my background and like my love and respect for it. And like, like you said, it being in my DNA, there's absolutely no way 
There's no way I could choose between the two. And I don't feel like I have to choose. I literally think my actual response to her was something along the lines of like, well, nobody really has told Oprah yet that she has to choose and she gets to do everything. (laughs) I think that was like my actual response to her because for me, anybody who knows me knows me, who has known me since childhood knows that like Oprah has always and still is my blueprint. Literally any and all things that she is interested in that really touches her soul, she goes after it and she does it. You know, like it doesn't have to make sense to everybody else, but she's been able to like be this big like media mogul, have her own show, act in her own things, write her own things, has a book, then the magazine. Now she's doing cook stuff. She also has home decor. No one has asked her to choose. And I think with fashion and beauty, they overlap and they go hand in hand so much. So I'm so glad I did not listen to this lady either. I say all that to say on the back end, I'm doing these things in fashion and my passion for beauty has just continued to grow, but it's also evolved. So it wasn't until probably my senior year of college that I was actually able to pinpoint what exactly it is that I want to do in beauty. I've always known that my love for beauty has always gone beyond the application. I didn't want to just be an influencer and not that there's anything wrong with that. I didn't want to just have a YouTube channel, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. I knew that I was really like excited about the innovation and formulations and new technologies with textures and ingredients. I love the whole idea of like brand storytelling and figuring out like, okay, who is it that they're trying to market to with this particular brand? I love indie brands because they really push the envelope and they add something fun and interesting and new to the industry. Whereas sometimes I feel like sometimes the gatekeepers kind of rest their laurels on the tried and true, the best sellers, you know, it is hard to pivot and it is hard to innovate when you have so much history and people get so caught up in history and heritage and what's comfortable and what's profitable. Before you go on, let me just pinpoint such an important point you made when you say you don't have to choose because Oprah didn't have to choose. Sometimes you go to people for advice and it might not be the right advice for you and you got to recognize that. So if you're in a search and you hear something that just doesn't feel right in your gut, seek out counsel from somebody else. That is so critically important. And I think that is right at every stage of your career. And I'm kind of here to tell you that I've straddled fashion and beauty my whole career. So (laughs) listen, it just is what it is. And I just did not believe that that was for me or that was my path. And I'm glad that I stuck with my gut and my intuition. Start Right Here is brought to you by Beauty Biz Camp, where we equip and inspire the next generation of industry leaders. Head over to our website, beautybizcamp.com, for more information and sign up for our mailing list so you can stay in the know about our upcoming programming. But yeah, so all of these things were the things that I was interested in when it came to beauty beyond the application of it. And I just really dove deep and did my research. And that's when I started discovering things such as like cosmetic chemistry and product development. And the thing is, is I've always, always, always had a love for science and I had a strong background in science. But when I was in school, this was before the huge like push for STEM. So a lot of the times the career options that were presented when it came to science was either like a chemistry teacher or like medical research. I'm still a creative at heart, so I knew that wouldn't feed me. So I just pivoted into other interests. But once I started discovering like cosmetic chemistry and that was like an actual thing and like product development and that was actually a thing, I was, wow, thanks New York. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we get it. But that's when I actually really realized like this could be something. And so I had been doing my research and that's how I connected with people like you and other incredible women who either worked in beauty or had their own beauty companies. And I was just like basically doing like informal interviews with them. I wasn't looking to like take anything from them or anything like that. I just wanted their time to just like hear their stories. And for me, it was all a part of like research to really understand like what those roles intake and is this the path that I want to go in because beauty is just so broad and there's so many things that you can do within it so I really wanted to be like clear and concise about okay if I do do this pivot what are we pivoting into sis 
<laughs> and you have to connect with people and you have to, you know, do your research. And so I had been saying for probably a little over a year, I think I'm ready to make that pivot into beauty. I hadn't applied anywhere, but I could just feel it like, mm, I think it's time to like move on from this. I loved Eloquy, but I was super hungry about beauty now. And the thing about beauty too is it's also extremely, extremely competitive. And it's really tough to get your foot in the door if you don't have any beauty experience prior to stepping into beauty. But what I did realize is that I had some really strong skills in social that are basically interchangeable with any industry that you go into. And I knew that Pivoting into beauty, doing something that I was already doing in fashion would probably be my best bet just to get my foot in the door with beauty. And it's funny how it all ended up coming full circle because during my time at Eloquy, we had gone to Essence Fest and we did like this pop up activation in New Orleans and I got to meet some incredible women. And there was this one woman that I connected with immediately. Her name was Cecilia and we just connected. She was so nice. She was obsessed with the brand, super stylish, very much had like that cool auntie kind of vibe. And she and I just connected. We just clicked and she just like latched onto me and was like, what do you do for Eloquine? I'm telling her like, oh, I work in marketing and social. And she was like, oh, we should talk. And I was just like, okay. Again, I just thought this was a nice woman. Had no idea like who she was or anything like that. And then it wasn't until later on, once I got home and like did some digging, she was actually worked at L'Oreal, um, but she worked in their diversity and inclusion. But still like she was just an incredible like connection to have to like, ask questions and get a better understanding of L'Oreal. And we connected, hit it off again, like didn't ask her for anything, but we just had this like natural bond. And on the back end, on the inside, Eloquy was starting to take meetings with, I believe it was the Carol's daughter team at the time to figure out how they could do another collaboration together because they had done one before in the past, I believe in like uh, 2012 or something like that. And that went really well with that. So All these things are happening and L'Oreal is starting to pop up naturally into my life, coming naturally into my life as I'm sitting here like at home manifesting this beauty career journey thing. And so I remember I was literally sitting at home. Mind you, again, I want to say I did not apply to anything. I hadn't applied to any jobs. Had I saved hella jobs on LinkedIn? Like, oh, this sounds interesting. Absolutely. But I hadn't applied to anything. I'm home, I'm sitting on the couch, I'm talking to my roommate because we're coming up on the new year and we're talking about vision boards and manifestation and everything like that. And I was talking about how this time around, I want to be super intentional with my vision board. I had L'Oreal on my vision board from last year. And by chance, I've been finding these connections with L'Oreal. This time I want to be super clear about what it is that I want when it comes to beauty because I'm going to put L'Oreal on my vision board again. And she's like, yeah, absolutely. We're talking to that. I have my laptop open, refresh my emails right at the top of my inbox. Digital marketing opportunity with L'Oreal. And I was like, is this a joke? So I stopped talking. My roommate is still, I've tuned her out to this point because I'm literally like, what is happening? Click open the email. It's a recruiter with L'Oreal who has found my profile on LinkedIn, loves my experience, and thinks I would be a good fit for a new position that has recently opened up. I'm immediately in shock. And I text my best friend because she works at L'Oreal at the time. And I'm like, should I take this serious? I'm going to like forward you this email. Like, is this a thing or is this spam? She's like, should I take it serious? She's like, hold on, forward me the email. I forward the email to her. She texts me back almost immediately. She's like, This is serious. This is real. How are we responding? Let's get this email draft together because you are responding tonight. She's very proactive and we are very much the same in that way of like, so how, what are we saying back to them? (laughs) Like, it's definitely always a we thing (laughs) when it comes to like major career things. Like, "Mm, 
change this sentence or oh let's tweak that like we do that for each other so she's like so what are we saying <laughs> and so I responded back to her and then if I will say one thing to anybody who's listening to this take this from me I went into this interview process. I was still going to bring my A game always because I wanted it, but I for sure went into this interview process thinking, I mean, this is, this is L'Oreal. They're so competitive. I mean, I'm sure they're interviewing so many other people. There's literally no way that I'm going to like get this. It's just so competitive, but Hey, at least I'm meeting the right people. At least I'm connecting da, da, da. So I say to those people who find themselves in similar situations, do not do that. There is a rhyme and a reason for everything that happens into your life. And when you are speaking things over yourself, there is power in the tongue, both positive and negative. So when you are speaking things over yourself and you are putting in the work and you are researching and things are starting to come up and turn around and things are manifesting, do not come into those situations with this mindset of like, there is no way. There's absolutely a reason there's absolutely a way that you could get this because your work and the time the effort that you have put into it is what has brought you to that point there's absolutely a way for this to happen there is no doubt that whatever this is whatever position is that you apply for that it will be yours and you need to believe that before anybody else believes that first and foremost so I'll say that to that so anyways I'm interviewing. I'm just like, oh, it's just round one. Like, I'm sure it's going to be super competitive, blah, blah, blah. So then it's round one. And now we're making it to round two. And then I get to round three and I'm talking to my best friend and she's like, the job is yours. And I was like, no, don't say that. Like, how do you figure? She's like, this is the third round of interviews. And the only person you're interviewing with is the AVP. Literally, the only time you make it to that point where you're sitting out with the AVP is because whoever you're reporting into has said like, hey, I like this person. I think this is the person I want to hire. I just need you to kind of like feel them out and then move forward. She's like, don't even be surprised if this isn't like a formal interview like everything else. If anything, it's going to be more conversational because she just wants to get to know you. I was in shock. I was like, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. I go into the interview and it's exactly how she said it would be. And I'm just like, did I just do this? Did I just, I, 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 so I have the interview. It's great. Two hours later, I get the call with the offer and I'm just like, so I work at L'Oreal now. Uh, (laughs) I screamed. I was so excited. I was so just like, oh my God, it's happening. You know? I always think to myself, because these dreams, the things that I've had, the goals that I've had for my life, these are things I have been literally been speaking over myself and speaking over my life since I was eight years old. I'm 28 now. And so for me, it always felt like these were like off in the distance, like, oh, maybe by like 30, 31, I'll work at L'Oreal. Not at 26, 27 am I doing these things. So I'm just like, I'm in shock. I'm just like, I'm, but I'm excited and I'm hungry for it. But I think that you make some such important points. First of all, it was on your vision board. First, you're talking about it generally. Then you're talking specifically about it. And then when it shows up, you got to be ready though. And it's that you spent some time honing your skills somewhere so that you could present these skills and pivot for this industry. So I think that's amazing. And for those listening who may have majored in other things. And there are paths to your dream if you look closely at how your skill set can be redirected in another industry, right? So you're working at L'Oreal. Let's talk about the difference between working in fashion and working in beauty. It's interesting because, so the one thing I can definitely speak to in regards to working in skincare and working with heels and stuff like that is I really had the opportunity to work closely with the brand marketing team to really understand formulation and claims because that's the whole thing with heels. It's their thing is all about the nature, the balance between nature and science. Their products are fantastic and their products are extremely effective. You know, Their claims are typically like right on the nose, right on the, as far as like what they say that they're going to do. And they put a lot of money and they put a lot of research and they put a lot of time into perfecting a formula. It's not 
uncommon for them to have a product that's like tested, tried and true. And then two years later, they've perfected it even more and will do a whole like relaunch behind it. The thing that I did find that was interesting between fast fashion and beauty is the timelines. So for me, working at Eloquy, I feel like we were always just on like high gear all the time because we were dropping collections every two to three weeks. So there was the constant need to like create new content, a new launch, supporting it on social, all of those things. Whereas with working with Kiehl's, we would get our calendar in advance and it would probably be six or seven drops spread out throughout the entire year and then of those maybe three of them are actually like new products and then the others are like relaunches of certain things or like adding in a support product for a pre-existing line so like we had the cannabis sativa seed oil and then uh three months later they launched a cannabis sativa seed cleanser to complete the collection type of thing so the timelines were different and so the other thing that was really different for me in my role in particular is my role with Eloquy in social media and like the things that I was doing was completely different than what I was doing at Kiehl's. So even though at Kiehl's, my role was social media manager, what I found that a good chunk of my work was actually in was actually influencer marketing, cultivating those relationships. If there was a product launch, you know, what is that going to look like on social in regards to influencer content? So then I would lead the charge on that as far as like who we should work with, What does that content look like? So putting together creative briefs, negotiating contracts um, for those projects. I was the one who was giving like final approval on said assets and then working with our uh, social media associate to figure out how we were going to weave those into our pre-existing social media content. And then I was also leading the Facebook page initiative in regards to content on the Facebook page. Facebook ended up being like a huge selling tool for us. So then I was also working with the digital marketing team to see like what products are performing well that we can use to cross promote on Facebook. And then what do those links need to link back to on the dot-com side for purchasing and everything like that. So that was my role there. There's also a difference between working at a, a startup culture and a legacy Right. Yes. That was the other part of it too. It, it's so huge and it's and if you let it, it is very easy to allow yourself to feel small. And that's the one thing I would say to anybody, and this is just me from my own personal experience, is you have to find a way to hold on to that strong, kick-ass, confident person you were when you walked in the door for that interview and continue to cultivate and build up that person when you step into a huge corporation such as one of L'Oreal. Because it's so easy to get swallowed up in how large this company is and everybody is a star, you know, in that sense. And you start to doubt yourself and question how you got there. And imposter syndrome is hella real. And if you don't nip it in the bud quickly, it will hinder you at larger companies. It will. It absolutely will. So you have to find a way to push and work through those sorts of things for the sake of your career development and your growth when you pivot from a small, nimble startup into a huge legacy corporation where offices are spread out across the globe and headcount is astronomical. <laughs> you have to for the sake of wanting to like stay in the game. That's really important. That in some ways is an unsung skill to realize that you got to remember yourself. So that, that's better than the skill. That's kind of like, you know, something that you have to just like, you have it in your toolbox and it is something that you have to activate, like know thyself and believe in thyself at all times. So, you know, you've had, uh, I mean, and now you're consulting. So when do you know when it's time to leave a job? I think it depends on the person. For me, I know 
when it's time to, because again, I'm very like headstrong. So I'm going to like push it and I'm going to push it and I'm going to push it and I'm going to work my butt off to try to make it work for as long as I possibly can. For me, in my instance, I knew it was time to go because literally my body was telling me it is time to go. I started to experience panic attacks. It is what it is. You know, I started experiencing panic attacks and this feeling of dread anytime I was riding the subway to come into work. My bad days were starting to outnumber my good ones. And it wasn't to say that my team wasn't amazing and that my time wasn't great there. But I think for me, in my case, when I came on board, my role very early on started to evolve rather quickly and they were pivoting into a different direction with what they actually needed of me. And it wasn't to say that I couldn't do the work that they were asking of me. It just, if I'm being frank, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do it because it wasn't what I was interested in and it wasn't what I thought my role was going to encompass when I was initially hired. And sometimes you don't know until you're in things and that's okay too. And that's why I say like for your twenties and stuff like that, that is your time to shift and pivot and try and test as many things as you can to really figure out what is important to you in a role, whether it's compensation, whether it's roles and responsibilities, whether it's work-life balance, like what does that mean to you too? And advocate for yourself once you do figure out what that is. And so I had a fantastic time during my time with Kiehl's. And I think the one thing that will always stick with me that I've always been incredibly proud of during my time there is the contribution that I made to the team, especially in working with influencer marketing in regards to giving them perspective about the kinds of influencers that they choose to work with and diversifying that pool by a lot. I think the thing that touched me a lot during my time is because I was the social media manager, but my focus, I would say probably like 50% of my role wasn't dealing with influencer marketing. So I was that go-to person that I was that face that the influencers knew I'm their contact for Kiehl's. And so I was able to build a lot of incredible relationships with women who come from a multitude of backgrounds. When we talk about diversity, it's not just from an ethnical standpoint. You know, we're talking about, are they working moms? Are they stay-at-home moms? Are they a hustler and a nine-to-fiver? Like, there's so many other ways to be diverse and inclusive. And it's also like, let's talk about skin diversity, too, in regards to everybody's not going to have picture-perfect skin. We are a skincare brand, so let's have that reflected. The girl who has rosacea, the girl who's suffering and dealing with adult acne, you know, like, let's build that up as well. So I think the thing for me that I'm always been most proud of is, like, being able to open up the door for influencers, a diverse group of influencers to be able to work with Kiehl's and people they maybe wouldn't have considered, or maybe they were were top of mind for them, but they just hadn't gotten to them yet. And like kind of pushing that forward. My proudest moments have always been when we've pulled off successful events and successful influencer trips and everything like that. And the feedback that I'm getting from these women that I've invited into the room of when they meet me, they're like, especially the influencers of color who are just like, oh my God, okay, now I understand like how I got here. I've been wanting to work with Kiehl's for so long. Thank you for inviting me. This is my first influencer trip. And these are girls who have like bukus of followers, incredible content, high engagement. And they're coming to me and they're telling me this is their first influencer trip. We did a really great one during my time there where we took 30 influencers to Seattle, Washington for an influencer trip. Incredible group of women, diverse across all marks. It was the best influencer trip that I've been on because these women connected with each other on such like a real level. Like some of these girls who connected and met on these trips are still friends to this day and have gone on to do like work together and collab on projects together and that kind of thing. But the feedback was just about like they were impressed by the diversity on this influencer trip and how it's been done in a genuine way. One girl on the trip is actually a native to Seattle and she has a working connection with the beauty director from Nordstrom and Nordstrom, their headquarters are out there. 
And she had been documenting her time on the trip and had been DMing back and forth with their beauty director. And the beauty director literally, she sent me the screenshot just to be like a good job sis type of thing because she and I connected. She was basically sent me a screenshot of her conversation with the beauty director for Nordstrom that was just like, can I just say like, this is by far the most diverse influencer trip that I've seen in years and it's been done the right way. And she sent like the side eye emoji, like wink, wink type of thing. And she responded back to her and was like, yes, it's been so incredible. These girls, the team, blah, blah, blah. Like they're amazing. The director then responded back to her and said, I got to be honest with you. Like I've pretty much been overlooking Kiehl's for quite some time now, but this trip has definitely made me want to take a second glance at them. Wow. That's a great compliment to the work. That's an incredible compliment. And like, I think the thing is too, is like for us, particularly as women of color, like taking those compliments and owning them. I think sometimes it's easy for us as women of color to be like the team and I, but no, like at the end of the day, that was a compliment to me and my work. I put together that guest list. I, along with great team members, put together what that trip was going to look like, the itinerary, all of that was me, you know, and like owning that and being proud of that. And I connected with some really great women and really great women of color too, who I was then able to, to like make good on the relationship that I built then. Because when we had a new launch, maybe two months later, Hey, I have some money to spend <laughs> in, <laughs> for this campaign. Would love to have you come on board. You know, what's your rate? So it felt good for me on the inside to not only be able to bring these women together, connect them and show them and showcase them to like my team and Kiehl's in general. But then it also felt good for me to be able to like close the loop on that and bring everything full circle by actually being able to put money in these women's pockets. So it felt good. Excellent. So you're back to startup. <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> back to startup. And I want just one day, could you just tell us a little bit more about Dark Beauty and the work that you're doing there? Absolutely. So like I said, for me, I was just like, my heart wasn't in it with what I was doing. And I knew that I needed to get out because it was starting to physically manifest itself. And it was also a really tough year for me at the end of that year, because I unexpectedly lost my grandmother, who was literally like my lifeline. And the grieving was just really tough. And I didn't want to bring my team down or anything like that. And I needed to advocate for myself and be like, hey, I'm not okay. I need to step away. So I did that and I did the work and I took the time. And then I was thinking about, okay, what's next? And I interviewed and everything like that. And there was great roles that came up, but nothing for me that was just like, oh my God, like I have to work there. I absolutely have to be there. I absolutely like nothing that sparked my passion. And so I started like looking more and more into like, mm, maybe I just consult, maybe I just freelance, that kind of thing. And so that's how Dark Beauty came into my life. So Dark Beauty is a digital community and content platform targeting women of color. Our pillars are really, really, really knee deep in community in support making sure that the women who are of dark beauty feel honored, feel supported, feel nurtured, feel celebrated in all aspects. So our content that we touch on is definitely around like lifestyle. So that's fashion, beauty, wellness, but we're like, you know, not afraid to go there either and have those tough conversations or have those taboo conversations to put the power back in our, our the women of our community's hands in regards to like, owning those topics, owning those subjects and like taking pride in them and taking pride in their interests. So the founder, Wilma, Wilma Basta, she's an incredible woman, phenomenal woman. She reached out to me on social media, which is like, hey, you know, I like your profile. I like what you've done. Like, would you be interested? We connected. She uh, gave me the full spiel, the full rundown about dark beauty, who they are and what they stand for. And I was sold. I was sold right then and there. I am always, 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 always going to advocate for women of color. And I think that's the thing that has always been a common thread throughout my career, regardless of where I am, from the smallest of companies to the largest of corporations. I'm always going to advocate for my brown and black women. That's just me. I feel like that's the call that's been placed on my life and in my heart. And I'm always going to do that. So being able to partner with a budding platform that that is their sole mission 
and it's through the lens of beauty and fashion and lifestyle, and they're having the most interesting conversations, sign me up. It's been incredible being with this team. We're small but nimble, and we've been able to accomplish a lot of amazing things in the short time that I've spent with this company. We actually just recently launched a mental health initiative called Dark Beauty Healing, in which we're aiming to give away 10,000 free hours of therapy to women of color um, in the U.S. who have been affected by uh, COVID-19. We've raised a, a little over 500 hours thus far in a matter of like 10 days. And we've had some really strong like allies rally behind and champion behind our initiative. So like Lala Anthony and Hannah Brockman and Jessica Garcia from On My Block have been incredible allies for us. And we're just continuing to build momentum around that because this is something that we want to continue to touch on year round. You know, mental health isn't just for the month of May, you know, mental health is something that should be spoken about all year round to empower these women who are by the multitudes being affected by it. And also in the same breath, not being able to be afforded resources, mental health services and resources, extremely underserved. So that's the thing. That's always the why for us is like anything that we do at Dark Beauty, the end goal is also then like, this is great for us, but the net net is also then how does our community benefit from this? What are they getting from it? It's amazing. It just sounds like a great platform. We'll have information in the show notes, the link to Dark Beauty so that you can check it out. Now we're going to move over. So Career Path has been full of lessons thus far. I can't wait to see where you're going next. Now let's move on to our fast track questions. What's the first beauty product you've ever purchased? First beauty product I ever purchased. Okay, so technically it wasn't a purchase. Or swiped from your mother's Mary Kay or whatever. Boom, there we go. I'm glad you said it. So it wasn't a a first purchase for me because I've been lucky enough that my mother was a Mary Kay consultant. So my mother's rule was always no makeup until you're 16. So on my 16th birthday, I specifically remember she gave me like this little makeup starter kit. And inside of it was a brown eyebrow pencil, like, gold a peachy like gold lip gloss some natural blush brown mascara not even black mascara because that was too grown apparently (laughs) brown (laughs) mascara and a little eyeshadow compact all neutral colors but that was like my makeup starter kit now that wasn't to say that I didn't have makeup prior to that because I wasn't a bad kid but the thing I did get in trouble for was makeup I was always sneaking, trying to wear makeup at school. I had this god-awful cobalt blue eyeshadow I used to sneak and wear at school all the time from the lid to the brow bone. Like, no shading, no just, like, literally like I was punched in the face by a smurf. (laughs) And I had a little gloss, and I was like, she's popping. She's gorgeous. She's cover girl. Like, absolutely not. Oh, my God. It was horrible. (laughs) But you couldn't tell me anything because then, of course, you have the blue to match the blue shirt that you're also wearing because that's the thing. It was god awful. What's the last beauty product or most recent beauty product you've tried? Mm, so the last beauty product I just tried is actually from Milk Makeup. They have this really cool new eyebrow pin thing, and it's supposed to mimic the effect of microblading. So like a I've- tattoo pen? Yeah, but it's interesting because I've had other like tattoo pens type of thing, but they've always been like that same shape of that felt tip that you find with like a a liquid liner. This one is like three pronged and it's kind of like tapered in a way. So when you flick your wrist, it actually like looks like hairs. It's been really interesting. I'm trying to figure out the right, because the thing is, it's like the tip is still somewhat squishy. That's the only thing is I wish my only critique milk if you're listening was if it was a little bit more firm because if you flick and press down a little too hard now it's just like a little squibby little blob on your on your eyebrow so I'm still working on the flick of the wrist and figuring it out but I love the overall effect it's fantastic so shout out to milk makeup what's the beauty advice you live by or leave alone 
I think the beauty advice that I live by and has always carried me through is my mom, she knew I loved makeup and she knew I loved beauty. But the one thing that she did always say to me when I first started wearing makeup was for me, she's saying to always remember that makeup is meant to enhance what you already have. So that's the one thing that I always keep in mind when I'm doing makeup, even when I do like bright, colorful looks and all that, like I still want to look like me. Like sometimes, especially working in social media, Instagram makeup can be really a a scary thing at times because you see the before and after and it's literally like looking at two different people. And then I think about the thing that kind of goes back to my mind always is then like thinking about those Gen Z girls and younger who are raised off of social media and that's their standard of beauty. And they think that that's what they have to look like all the time like it's a wild thing and like social can be such a beautiful thing as far as like connecting people and branding and all of that but it can also be the dark side of it is like the body dysmorphia and like the insecurities that can be planted you know if you don't check yourself really quickly about it do you think this pandemic will do anything to change that you think there'll be a shift into more natural makeup because of it I think, well, the one thing that's been nice is when working with L'Oreal is being privy to like data and information. And that shift is already happening before the pandemic. Like color cosmetics were down something crazy, like 60% or some kind of crazy number. You are seeing that shift and girls who do want their skin to actually like look like their skin and they're investing more, even if they don't need it. Like the amount of young girls who are investing time and effort in skincare when it's literally like, oh, sweetheart, <laughs> you don't know skincare until you had a for real, for real breakout like type of thing. But the girls who are investing in skincare and clean beauty is continuing to rise. And like the glossier effect, like girls wanting their skin to look like skin and this whole minimal thing. It's not to say that it will go away completely because people are creatives and everybody wants to express themselves. So like crazy colors and stuff like that are definitely never going away. But I think like, the block brows are kind of like chilling out a bit. The extreme contouring is like now more so for like those glam moments. So it'll be interesting to see where the market continues to take us for sure. Yeah, I agree that I think that, you know, it had already shifted. They'd been talking about it actually for a couple of years that it was going to shift. But I think that this moment has made a big shift across generations in terms of makeup usage. Who gave you the best career advice and what was it? I think the person who gave me the best career advice, I don't think it was advice as much as for me, it was confirmation. For me, like I've said, I've always had lofty goals since I was a young girl, always. And I've never really hesitated and thought to myself, like, is this crazy? Is this too big? Is this unrealistic? I think a lot of that is shout out to my parents because for me, they've always been ride or dies. Like any and all things that I've wanted to try, okay, let's go for it. Let's figure out where's a class you can take for that. Let's see if there are any books on that that you're interested in. They've always been down for me figuring out who it is that I wanted to be in this world and what I wanted to do career-wise and helping me to understand the difference and distinguish the difference between having a job and having a career. I say all that to say, The best piece of confirmation that I've received was definitely during my time at InStyle. There was a woman there. Her name was Diana. And she was, at the time, I believe she was InStyle director, I think. It was really interesting because they had a style director and a fashion director. And I'm like, isn't that like this? I don't know. Anywho, (laughs) she was on the editorial team. Don't quote me on the title. And I think now she's at Pop Sugar, actually. But she was one of those people that really like took me under their wing during my time at InStyle and really nurtured my interest in fashion because my time at InStyle was a pivotal moment because they were really interested in figuring out how to tap back into plus size fashion. And then here I am, this young girl into plus size fashion. So for me, I was like a well of knowledge and I was just giddy and excited. I had somebody who was going to listen to me and then also like implement some of the things I had to say. So we'll forever be grateful for that. But anyways, she sat me down on a photo shoot and she was just like digging deep into like me and like 
what I wanted to do and like, what is my actual goal? Like, what is the bigger picture at hand? And I'm explaining it to her. And as I'm explaining to her and like saying it out loud, because I've always said it to friends and I've always said it to family. I've never said it to somebody in the actual like profession or field that I'm interested in. So as I'm saying it, I'm starting to kind of like doubt myself a little bit. And I'm like saying like things like, you know, but I don't know, like, maybe I'm crazy. Like, maybe that's unrealistic. Maybe that's too big. And she just stopped me. And she was just like, absolutely not. She just like affirmed me in so many ways of just saying how like, one of the things she admired about me was my drive, my tenacity. And she's like, I wouldn't be surprised if five to six years from now, like, you're going to be a force to be reckoned with in this field. And it's because of that raw drive, that raw passion that you have. She's like, I wouldn't be surprised if I look up and you are quickly becoming like the go-to source for that cool plus size girl who's into fashion, who's into beauty, who's into lifestyle. And they're looking to you to figure out and learn what's next, what's the trends that they should be on, what's going to be the next wave. Like, she's like, you're a tastemaker and that's going to be powerful. And like, just all of these things. And like, for me, it was just kind of like, it affirmed me in so many ways of like, my dreams are real. My dreams are not too big. If anything, I can blow them out and make them bigger if I wanted to. And just to continue to like, do the work. And for me, I've always been the type of person where my career, especially in my early 20s, as you can tell from hearing from me, I've ping pong quite a bit. But everything has always tied back and closed the loop in some way. And I know with my larger career goal in mind, it'll all make perfect sense when I'm doing what I'm doing. So Yeah. And even if it doesn't, there's the lessons that come from each stop that kind of like inform your bigger goal, whether they're directly related or not related. So I totally agree with that. Last question. What is your best interview prep tip? you can give the audience? What should they be doing in preparation for an interview? I'm an advocate for social stalking. Like, I'm the type of person, once I figure out, like, who I'm going to be interviewing with, like, yes, I'm going to look them up on LinkedIn. But yes, I am also going to look them up on social because I think it is nice to find somewhere something that you can pull from and draw from that's like a connection. Because at the end of the day, like, I think it helps them to know that you've done your research, like, you took the time and effort to, like, get to know them and know who they are, not just, like, who they are from, like, a company standpoint, but, like, what are some of their interests and that kind of thing on, like, a more personable level. And then I think for you on the back end, it helps to take some of the nervousness out of it to remember, like, at the end of the day, like, this person is still just a person, you know? And I think that allows you some sort of, like, ease when you are making conversation. And I think the other thing is too, is like doing your homework on the company that you are interviewing for. Sometimes even the most obscure of details, like not just the things that make major headlines with a company, but really dig deep into like tech crunch and stuff like that. And like, What are some interesting things they've done from a business perspective with their stocks or maybe they've acquired somebody recently that people aren't really talking about, like to let them know that like you're fully invested in this company and the growth that they're making, you know, and that you know how to do your homework and you know how to dig deep. And if you say that you've read something about them, actually read it. Because there are those interviewers who, if they're interested and they are impressed, they want to dig a little deeper and say, like, oh, what part of that did you like? What did you like about this article? What did you like about that campaign? Did you see the one from last month? Tell me your thoughts. You got to be prepared. So be ready. Not only do your research, but be ready. Courtney, this has been amazing. Be ready, folks. Be ready. Be ready. I think that you know your advice is not only good for someone starting out or looking to change careers, but anybody looking, the idea of being proactive in the search and tenacious, and especially in these changing times, you know, post COVID-19, we don't know what the industries will be like fashion and beauty, but employing some of these skills will get you in the game as opposed to just hitting apply on LinkedIn or wherever, or indeed. I can't thank you enough for joining me. I'm really, really excited to watch where your career is going to go. Can I just also say thank you to you as well? Like, 
I know you didn't delve into it like in the episode and everything like that, but you were also one of those people when I was interested in doing the work and doing the research in regards to beauty who answered my call and was incredibly gracious about it in offering me your time, in connecting me with people. And for that, I have forever been changed for real. I seriously am always just in awe and incredibly thankful for the dynamic women of color that I come into contact with who see enough in me to say, I'll answer this email because sometimes that's really all it takes. I'll answer this email. Sure. I'll take her call. Sure. I'll meet her for coffee. And I've, I have never, never not been grateful for the opportunity to just like take up space and take up some of your time and just been able to connect with you. So thank you to you too for the work that you're doing because I think that it's incredibly important. And like I said to you when I first met, like I so wish there had been something like this, like when I was younger to have some type of like guide, to have like some type of portal of resources to like dig into. So the work that you're doing is so valid and so important. So thank you to you too for your services that you're providing as well. You know, I live for this sort of stuff. Like, so you, you know, I have a passion for this and being able to kind of bring it to a wider audience. It's just a gift. Thanks again. Thank you. That's our show for today. Remember that there's more than one way to the top. And the most important step is the first one. So start right here.